Good morning, and welcome to the English service, Mandarin Baptist Church. I'm delighted that you have joined us this morning. Would you join with me in prayer as we ask the Lord's blessing on this hour? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to be able to gather in your name once again. God, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your direction. Thank you that we are able to draw strength from you in our times of need. Thank you, Lord, that you are our strong tower that we may run into. You are our refuge. God, we come together this morning to celebrate you, to worship you in praise and song and in word. Lord, I pray that as we worship you and as we study from your word, that you would empower us not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers. We commit this hour to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's join together and worship in song and praise. I worship you with all my heart. I worship you with all my soul for you. The Holy One, I put my faith in you, Jesus take my hand, let me follow you, change my life, oh it be like new I will follow you Lord every day of my life I will worship you Lord every day of my
follow you, Lord, every day of my life, I will worship you, Lord, every day of my life, I will follow you. You are 
I've been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for you and for what you have done in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one who provides. You're the one who sustains. You are our rock. Thank you, Lord, for your provisions and that you take care of all of our needs and then some. 
God, thank you that it is our privilege today to bring our offering that belongs to you. It is our acknowledgement that you are ultimately in control of all things and that our trust is in you. So we give cheerfully, not out of duty, but because in our heart of hearts, it is our desire to honor you with our gifts. Bless these offerings, Lord. And may they be used to further your kingdom. God, thank you for this opportunity now to break open the word of God and to, to receive instruction from what you have to say. We ask that you bless our time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me encourage you to go to our website, uh, go, the number two, mbc.org. It's on your screen there for any pertinent information regarding uh, our services and the potential for reopening uh, and all the necessary information for Sunday school and children's connections uh, through Zoom. So let me encourage you to go to our website for all of that information. I want to ask all those of you who are married, uh, I would ask you to, if you feel so led, and if you're daring, to please send in a photograph, a digital photograph uh, of your wedding day. What I'd like to do is to accumulate as, as, as many as I can from our congregation uh, and uh, we'd like to put that on display uh, on our website and also a physical display in the coming weeks here uh, in, in our church building. And so I, let me encourage you to do that. They would, it would be fun to see everybody's wedding day pictures. And so please send those in in the next, uh, in the next week. I will uh, send you an email reminder as well. For that. Uh, a Sunday school class, they were teaching how God created all things. They were going through Genesis and they were teaching this creation, including how God made man and uh, woman. And little Johnny, who was a kindergarten, he was especially interested in the part where God took a rib from the man and he created this woman. And uh, later on that week, Johnny was not feeling good, and he was in his room and just kind of clutching his side. He had a stomach ache. And so his mom walks in, and he's, she says, Johnny, what's wrong? And he said, Mom, I don't feel so good. I think I'm going to have a wife. That's a... Uh, that's a funny story. I don't know if it's true or not. I just picked that up uh, in one of our books. But here's a true story. There was a very unusual military funeral in California in December 2013. Sergeant First Class Joseph Gant, who fought in both World War II and the Korean War, was laid to rest. He'd been captured in Korea in 1950, and he died the following year. But his body was not returned for many years, and his death was never confirmed by the North Koreans. His wife, Clara, she waited for decades for her husband to come back. She regularly went to meetings with government officials seeking information about what had happened. Claire even bought a house and had it professionally landscaped so Joseph, all that he would have to do when he came home was to go fishing. She was 94 years old 
when his remains were finally brought home for a military funeral with full honors. It wasn't the homecoming she dreamed of, but she finally knew his fate. Clara told a reporter who interviewed her. She said, he told me if anything happened to him, he wanted me to remarry. And I told him, no. Here I am, still his wife. And I'm going to remain his wife until the day the Lord calls me home. Deep down, we all wish for that kind of love, don't we? Those kinds of stories, they, they warm our hearts and we want to know what's, what's their secret. In 2005, the Guinness Book of World Records said that Percy and Florence Aerosmith held two records. The longest marriage of a living couple, which was 80 years they had been married. And the other record was having the largest married couple's aggregate age, which combined was 205 years. Both Mr. and Mrs. Aerosmith have since died, but they left good advice for those who want to have a lasting marriage. Here's what Florence said. You must never go to sleep, bad friends. If you've had a quarrel, you make it up. Never be afraid to say, I'm sorry. Now, Percy, he had a slightly more humorous advice. He said the secret to his long marriage was just two words. Yes, dear. The most significant book of instructions for a successful marriage has got to be the Bible. It includes the origin of marriage and its purpose. And so today we're going to look at Malachi chapter 2. Now, just a little background on Malachi. It was written about a hundred years before the return of the Israelites from exile. The temple had been rebuilt. People had hopes of rebuilding the rest of the nation. And they wanted things to get back to normal. It's kind of like how we feel in some small significant way. They were hoping for a united kingdom once again, and they would hope that they hoped that that would usher in peace and justice. But things were not so. They weren't going as well as they hoped. And we read about that in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. The reality was that it took little time for corruption to creep back in. And they proved to be just as unfaithful as their ancestors. And that resulted in poverty and injustice. Now, Malachi is a, is a series of disputes where... Uh, God says something to accuse the Israelites of wrongdoing. And then they disagree or they question God's statement or accusation. And then God responds and offers the last word. This happens three times uh, in the book of Malachi. In the first three, God exposes their corruption. And in the last three, God confronts their corruption. But in the, the, the overarching theme uh, in, the, in the whole book throughout all six of the disputes and encounters is that people of Israel had not changed since returning home from exile. Now the first dispute 
God says, I still love you. And then people respond, well, how have you shown us any love? And then God says, I chose Jacob's family, and that is their fathers. I chose Jacob's family to carry my covenant promises. That's how I showed my love. I chose Jacob's family and not Esau's family. The second dispute is where God says, you despise me and you defile my temple. And the people respond, well, how have we despised you? And God responds with, by bringing lame, sick, blemished animals as offerings. The sad truth was it wasn't just the people, but it was also the priests who were in charge of the temple. They, too, were corrupt. And the third dispute is where God accuses them of treachery, and that is to, to betray his trust. And he accuses them. He says, you've turned against me and your wives. They want to know why. What have we done? And then God says he exposes the toxic combination of idolatry and divorce. On the one hand, men were marrying non-Israelite women and they were worshiping their foreign gods. And then secondly, men were divorcing their wives for any reason. God said, no. It is a betrayal of your covenant with him. So let's take a look at the passage where, uh, that we're going to be looking at today, which is Malachi chapter 2, verse 10 through 16. Now, this was the third dispute that I just alluded to. Verse 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Now here, Malachi is admonishing the Israelites to remember who they are. You can hear the implied speech, the implied question there. Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten who you belong to? And that begs a question for us. So I ask you this question. Do you ever find yourself in a place where you need to be reminded of who you are in Christ? I know I have. Many times. Maybe it's, it's an argument with someone. Maybe it's a place that you know you shouldn't be. It could be a physical place, a physical location, or it could be an emotional place, like a place of anger. Maybe it's a, a prideful place, a jealous or even a vengeful place. And we need to snap out of it to refocus on who we are in Christ. And that's what Malachi is, is doing here as a prophet. By the way, there are people in our church and other churches that have the gift of prophecy. And that's primarily their responsibility is, is to exercise their gift and waking us up and to pointing to our wrongdoing. To help us snap out of where we are. To awaken us out of our self-indulgence. The word profaning here means polluting or defiling. Now, I, I just got to say this, that many Christians, that we, we hear a lot about pollution 
And, and so many Christians spend so much more energy, far more energy, on polluting the air and, and, and water. And they're more concerned about the air and the water than they are about polluting God's covenant. They're more concerned about saving the whales and dolphins than they are about unborn babies. Wake up, the prophet says. Have you forgotten that you belong to God? Have you forgotten that it is, this is not the way that you are supposed to treat one another? A friend of mine, his name is Benny, and he's been to this church a few times. Until he retired in 2018, he spent his career in the, as, a, as a court clerk in the Los Angeles County court system. He, he told me of an occasion when church leaders had a dispute, and so they sued each other. Can you imagine? There they were at opposite ends of the courtroom, pointing fingers at one another. And the judge in this case, who was not a Christian, told them that he thought the good book said they weren't supposed to sue one another. And he ordered them to go into a room, into a conference room, and settle their differences. Now this story has a happy ending. That was a wake-up call for them. When the judge brought up the good book, it was like a light went on in each of their hearts. And they asked each other for forgiveness. And they hugged it out. Well, I don't, I don't know if they did a lot of hugging. It was an Asian church, but I'm sure they did a lot of bowing. But the point is, they came to their senses. Nothing good happens when we take our focus off of God and onto our circumstances. But on the other hand, good things and even great things happen when our focus is on him. So now we see in verse 11 that Malachi unveils their offense. This is what they were guilty of. He says in verse 11, Judah has been faithless and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary, sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves and has married the daughter of foreign gods the word faithless here just it actually means treachery it means to violate the standard perpetually it's not a one-time offense this is over and over and over the question is how has the people whom god chose to fulfill his covenant promise with stand accused of committing an abomination the answer is judah has polluted the sanctuary of the lord by marrying foreign women who continued to worship their own gods in premarital counseling i sometimes encounter couples where one or the other is a non-believer in those cases, I do my best to share the gospel with that non-believer. But if he refuses to believe, I will not officiate the wedding. Because I know that marriage is hard enough when both parties are standing on the same foundation. When they are not, they don't have a chance. But having said that, 
if a married couple comes to me for counseling and their one or the other is an unbeliever, my counsel to them is to stay married. Because once you are married, whether you are a believer or not, your marriage is a covenant marriage with God. And the bond should not be broken. It's one of the reasons marriages should never be entered into lightly. It should be for life without the possibility of parole. Now Malachi is saying here, he's not saying stop being married to them. What was happening in this situation was that these men were married to foreign women who were worshiping foreign gods. And the men themselves were worshiping those gods. Now that was the problem. Verse 12, May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. When I first moved to Los Angeles in 2002, I had a culture shock. It wasn't the gas prices or the cost of a gallon of milk, although those, that was, that was a, a shock in itself. Housing prices, double, in some cases triple. I could handle all that. But what was shocking to me was a level of acceptance by those who call themselves Christians of other religions. It was not unusual for me to hear of a Christian who also practiced other religions. They took a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Beliefs. While being a Christian, beliefs of reincarnation and all sorts of other things. All the while proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. It did not make sense to me. And that's kind of what was happening here. The people of God were also bowing down to other idols. And here Malachi is asking for God to cut off anyone who dishonors God by worshiping these foreign gods. And then they have the audacity to come into God's temple bringing an offering as though any, everything was okay. Now in verse 13, God levels the second offense against his people. Verse 13 says, And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accept it with favor from your hand. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you sense that God stopped blessing you or that you sense that he was far from you or perhaps you were far from him. But it's a, it's a lonely, lonely place. And Malachi here describes these men coming to the altar weeping with tears because God no longer desires their offering. He says, I don't want it. It's meaningless. Why? Verse 14. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been Faithless, though she is your companion 
and your wife by covenant. This was their second offense. They were not faithful to their wives. Now, a couple of key words, key phrases in this verse. First, I want you to notice that the Lord was the witness in their union. Now, when you were united in marriage, God was your supreme witness. I'm sure most of you, you had many witnesses there. And some of you even had one or two of those witnesses sign your marriage license or your marriage certificate. But far more important than those witnesses was and is God as your witness. Now you might say, well, I wasn't a Christian then, so how could God have been my witness? The answer to that is that marriage is a God-ordained institution. So whether it was, uh, you were a Christian or whether it was a Christian wedding or not, it's a covenant with Him. Where he is the supreme witness. And he holds you in account. For your actions. The second thing I want you to notice there. It says uh, a companion and your wife by covenant. Marriage is a covenant relationship. And I've been asked. Uh, is a covenant the same as a contract? It's like a contract, but it's so much more. In fact, the Hebrew word for covenant can be translated as a contract, but not in a contract that you and I uh, are aware of and familiar with today. Today's contracts, they're based on mistrust and suspicion. You draw up a contract because you want to hold that other party to his or her word. And you don't trust that they're going to stay true to their word. And so you draw up a contract. A contract is based on mistrust and Suspicion. But a covenant is based on trust and faithfulness. It's a bond that you make with another party because of trust, because of faithfulness. A contract is written on a piece of paper to make sure that each party follows their commitment. covenant is written on your heart with a contract a breach of that contract means that you can escape from it if the other party does not hold up to their end of the bargain then you are free that you can escape that it's null and void in many cases but with a covenant, when there is a breach, it's always looking for a way back. It's always looking for a way to reconnect. Always looking for redemption and forgiveness. It looks for a way home. When I counsel married couples who are in trouble and they're contemplating either separation or divorce. And even as they walk down that road, I always tell them, even as you walk away, always look back over your shoulder. Look for any sign of hope. 
Look for any sign of forgiveness. Look for any sign of redemption and restoration. Let's look at verse 15. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. What was the one God seeking? What was he looking for? What was he looking to get out of this union? Godly offspring. Yet another generation to which he can pour himself into. Devoted followers of Yahweh. Who made them one according to verse 15? God did. He is the one who joins us together with our spouse. It's not the preacher who does that? It's not the judge. It's not even the state. God does. God joins them into their union. God is the one who makes them one. It's His union and His covenant. It's why you don't enter into marriage lightly. It's not a, well, we're going to give this a shot and see if it works. You begin with the hope that it is God who joined you together. It is God who brought you together. Not some infatuation and not some physical attraction. But ultimately, it was God who brought you to together the reason you need to be mindful of these things is because there will come a time in everyone's marriage when their union will be tested and the only thing that will keep you together is knowing that God had a hand in it verse 16 for the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not be faithless. Do not act or deal treacherously or to betray your wife. Now some translations here for the man who does not love his wife, they translate that to say God in his God speaking, I hate divorce. I know it's it's so not even close, right? But it, it's as I've said before, the the Hebrew word has a, a very wide range of meaning. And context is what determines what the writer is trying to convey. And I think in this case, the, the ESV uh, translation is probably the more accurate translation. So for the man who does not love his wife, but divorces her instead. The Lord has a warning, a strict warning. It says he covers his garment with violence. That sounds awful. That sounds terrible. And it is. But let's look at the meaning. The word garment is, uh, I mean, covering the garments means it's a metaphor for not being able to escape. So there's no, there's no getting around that there's no over time that, that you're, you're going to be out of the woods. Then the word violence here means actively uh, I mean, activity, excuse me, that transgresses moral or civil law. 
Meaning you're, you're always going to be in trouble with the law, not, not civil law in the sense of the world, but with God's law. You're not going to be able to escape it. So guard yourselves in your spirit. Don't be. Don't be faithless. Now he repeats that. He, uh, um, it was in a previous verse. It's important. Malachi is saying that we guard ourselves. He indicates the importance of being on guard and being faithful. On July 10th, 1982, I stood at the altar with my bride and I entered into a covenant marriage. Several witnesses. The most important witness was the Lord. My brother-in-law, Mitch, uh, who officiated the wedding, the ceremony, he read a poem that has been a, sort of a periodic reminder when I hear it or when I see it, but a reminder of my dependence on God for the success of my marriage. It goes like this. I once thought marriage took just two to make a go, but now I am convinced it takes the Lord also. And not one marriage fails where Christ is asked to enter as lovers come together with Jesus at the center. But marriage seldom thrives and homes are incomplete till he is welcome there to help avoid defeat. In home where Christ is first, it's obvious to see those unions really work for marriage still takes three. Is God the center of your marriage? Is he the source of your strength, your wisdom and perseverance to endure any obstacle? Do you trust him to be your guide in good times and in, in hard times? Make it so today. Commit your marriage to him. today covenant with God for your marriage let's pray father we thank you for the gift of marriage we thank you Lord that it's a wonderful thing it is it is your creation God, we thank you that there are so many successful and wonderful marriages in our congregation. Yet, Lord, we know that there are some who struggle. But I believe, Lord, that when they covenant with you and when they seek you and they seek your guidance, they seek your word and your instruction that they are able to endure any obstacle. Not that they would just get through it without killing each other, but they would actually thrive in their marriage and their marriage would be a blessing to themselves and to their children and to many others. So I pray, Lord, that you would bring each marriage in our congregation and within the sound of my voice. That you would restore 
and that you would grant them courage to covenant with you, that they would refocus on you, the author and the finisher of their faith. God, I pray for those who are in marriages where their spouse is not a believer. I pray, Lord, for patience, for perseverance. I pray, Lord, that their love for you and their devotion to you and to their spouse would win them over, that they would see Christ in them, and that those who are non-believers would come to faith in Christ. Give us courage, Lord, to live out our faith in our marriages. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, beloved, I want to thank you for joining us today uh, on this beautiful Sunday. And I look forward to being with you again next week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may you have a wonderful and great and blessed week in him. And remember, because he loves you, go love people. God bless you.